Hello and welcome again to Microeconomics. Today we're going to talk about the second most frequently occurring industrial organization. Last time we talked about monopolistic competition, which is the most frequently occurring. Today we're going to talk about the one that occurs uh, not quite as frequently, but we see lots of really good examples of it. And so today we're going to talk about oligopoly. Now oligopoly is kind of a mouthful, kind of a, a lot of word there, but it's a very frequently occurring um, industrial organization. So let's look at the characteristics of oligopoly. Oligopoly occurs in cases where you have a few sellers, and few is not very well defined. I normally think in terms of three to five, something in that neighborhood, very small number. What makes it very different and what usually defines it is that there are substantial barriers to entry. So it's not like monopoly where there are absolute barriers to entry. That is, in a monopoly case, there is only one producer. There's no way for anybody else to get in there. In this case, we have strong barriers to entry, but typically speaking, uh, it is possible for people to join the industry. Typically what causes that is economies of scale, and we'll come back to that in just a second, but uh, probably the classic example of oligopoly, and this is not as much the case today as it was in the past, but uh, if you think back a few years to when the big three automakers in the United States uh, were basically the major producers of automobiles, then that was a very easy to see oligopoly example. Um, and there are strong economies of scale. There wasn't anything keeping other people from making automobiles other than the fact that it was just going to be a really expensive undertaking for someone to get into it. Sometimes, occasionally, an oligopoly exists because of legal restrictions that you have to have some sort of a, um, a, an agreement from the government, you have to have some sort of a license or something of that sort in order to operate in the industry. Sometimes oligopolies occur because of brand names. Um, the name brand is so strong that as a result, uh, no one wants to compete in the industry. The cola industry is a good example of this. There are two very strong brand names in Coke and Pepsi, and so as a result, uh, they're mostly an oligopoly. There are lots of other producers of soft drinks, uh, but, many, uh, but most of them are very small players. Sometimes it occurs because they have control, the companies have control over some sort of an essential resource. They're the only ones who have access to whatever the resource is that's needed in the production. And as was the case uh, with the auto industry, sometimes it's just sheer cost of entry. So in the case of an automobile industry, if you want to get in the automobile business, it's entirely possible for you to do it, but you need to come with tens of billions of dollars in order to open your very first uh, plant because it's so expensive to get started. The result is oftentimes they simply crowd out the competition. Uh, if you know the history of the auto industry, there was lots of producers. There were hundreds of producers of automobiles at one time but some of the um, major players got so large they simply crowded everyone else out. So what do we mean by barriers to entry, economies of scale as a barrier to entry? Well, here's an example of a production process in which there are very substantial economies of scale. If I move from producing S to producing M automobiles, I see a very drastic drop in the cost of producing those. And this is the case for automobiles. And so if I want to be a small producer of automobiles, I'm going to have a really hard time doing it. Uh, the reason being that my automobiles are going to be so expensive that nobody's going to be able to buy them. So this is a case, and this is kind of the classic for uh, oligopoly. Uh, an industry in which it takes a tremendous amount of uh, capital equipment in order to make it. Same thing was true for many, many years in the steel industry uh, in which there were several very large steel manufacturers, but uh, there weren't many small ones. Uh, today, through the use of technology, that's not the case anymore. The result of this is there are basically four different models for how oligopolies act. 
or how oligopolies interact would probably be a better um, term for that. One of the things that we observe about oligopolies is they always consider themselves to be interdependent. Since they're a small number of members of the, the industry, when they think about changing things, when they think about making strategic decisions, they always consider what will my competitor do if I do that. So one of two things happens. Either they cooperate or they compete very fiercely with one another. Typically, cooperation is the most, is the most likely thing that will occur. That is, if I am an automobile manufacturer and there are only two other automobile manufacturers, when I consider raising the price of my automobiles, I'm going to think to myself, what will the others do if I raise the price of my automobile? In fact, there's a whole group of theory uh, related to this, and it's called the kink demand theory, in which we think about what, would ha what will be the likely reaction of, of the other people within the industry. It's also entirely possible that they might collude, which is a cooperative interdependence structure, or um, more tacitly do price leadership. And finally, one way of explaining or modeling oligopolies is known as game theory, and I'll give you a little flavor for that and then we'll leave it be. So what's collusion? Collusion means that the firms actually get together and decide how to, mar how to divide the market and fix the price. In this country, that's illegal. Uh, in this country, the Sherman Antitrust Act makes that an illegal uh, thing and you can uh, find yourself in real trouble r very quickly. However, uh, if it's an international group of firms, uh, this country may not have much to say about it, and so we see the arisal of cartels. And cartels are a group of firms that agree to collude and act as a monopoly in order to increase economic profit. The most widely known, the most um, prevalent um, cartel is OPEC, which is the Organization of Pet Petroleum Exporting Countries, and they are a cartel. They actually meet and determine uh, a target price system, they actually determine a, a price range now, and they divide up the production. So essentially what they do is they say we're going to determine how many, what quantity to produce in order to meet a certain price level and then we're, you know, we'll parcel that out to the various different countries. So essentially what they do is they act as if they were a monopolist and they uh, produce at a point where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which gives them a target price. And again, oftentimes in the case of OPEC, they actually um, have a whole range of those. From those, from that target price, from that uh, target uh, quantity of output, they parcel that out to the various members of the community. And the result of that is each and every country abides by a certain level of sales. They do that in order to maximize their profit. So they allocate the output among the cartel members in order to maximize their profit. Uh, and they essentially try to produce such that the marginal cost is the same across the various different producers. Now cartels are notoriously unstable. And in fact, OPEC is, is a very unstable one uh, despite what you uh, despite having some control over price, uh, they frequently don't get the prices that they want to get and they're always walking a fine line trying to decide exactly what price it should be uh, because you don't want to get it so high that it kills off all your customers. Some of the other reasons why a cartel typically has problems is that the product is differentiated. We think of oil as all being the same, but the truth of the matter is oil is very different depending on where it's actually pumped from. So oftentimes a refinery that is uh, designed to, to use Texas oil can't use Saudi Arabian oil because it has different constituents. It has more sulfur in it. And so the product is not uniform. It's not homogeneous. It's in fact heterogeneous. It's also the case that various different countries have different average cost structures. And so as a result, um, they're 
decision about whether to abide by the cartel output allocation or not uh, depends on what, um, what their cost structure is. And finally, um, the real problem with a cartel is cheating. Uh, you as an individual member of the cartel uh, have a reason to want to cheat on the other members of the cartel because uh, often it, by, by cheating on them you make a higher profit. And this has very much been the case with OPEC. Uh, one of the reasons that um, uh, the countries in the Middle East were not particularly upset with us when we invaded Iraq is because Iraq was a notorious cheater. Uh, they notoriously sold twice to three times as much oil as they were supposed to, uh, and so um, they kind of turned their backs when, when they moved in there. And the same thing's true of several other countries um, as well. They notoriously don't abide by the output levels that they're supposed to. Um, and so ultimately cartels tend to, have, to disintegrate on their own. Now, since that's illegal in this country, since collusion is illegal in this country, often what we see in this country in oligopoly industries is tacit collusion. collusion. Uh, it's informal, that is the companies don't get together and decide on a price or an output level. Uh, they follow the price leadership of someone within the industry. And there's several different ways to do that. One is that you can follow the lead industry, leader in the industry. So uh, as an example, in the, the cola industry, if, if uh, Coca-Cola raises their prices, then everybody else raises theirs as well. Um, they're such a big um, part of the industry that they simply follow along and let them be the leader. It's also possible that you might have a particular industry or a particular member of the industry, a particular firm, which is sort of your barometer. They have prices that are, uh, they have costs that are reflective of everybody else's cost and so everybody else watches them as they change, the others change. And so there's lots of different ways of tacitly following the price leader and tacitly doing what they do without formally agreeing on what levels will be um, agreed to. Now remember again that there are, that it is illegal in this country to agree on, price, on prices or quantities of output and that it is often the case that cheating takes place on that and that price leadership ultimately fails as well. Now one way of trying to model this behavior is what's known as game theory. And game theory is exactly what it seems to be. It's a way of modeling the strategic moves and counter moves among rival firms. Because remember, in this case, in the case of oligopoly, we always consider what our rival does before we make a choice. And so it only seemed natural that you might could model it on the basis of game. And so what we attempt to do is to try to figure out where are the incentives to co cooperate and where are the incentives to compete, and from that perhaps understand exactly uh, how this operates. I'll give you an example of one. Um, this is probably the most famous game, and maybe it'll give you a flavor for how game theory works. And th this one is referred to as the prisoner's dilemma, in which you have two thieves, uh, they're caught in the act of breaking into to, um, some business. They are immediately apprehended and separated. And so once they're separated, the player themselves have to think about, well, what am I going to do? Am I going to confess or am I not going to confess? And you can put that into a matrix. Here you have uh, the two thieves are Jerry and Ben. Uh, they have a choice between confessing and not confessing. And you see in the matrix the payoffs for various different levels. So in the upper left one as an example, if Jerry confesses and Ben confesses, both of them get five years in prison. On the other hand, if Jerry refuses to confess but Ben confesses, then Jerry draws ten years in pr prison and Ben gets off. Uh, the opposite is the case, of course, when Jerry confesses and Ben doesn't. 
But if you'll notice from this matrix, the best thing that they possibly could do is neither one of them confess. If neither of them confesses, then the two of them only get a year apiece. Now the problem with that is that as you're sitting over there by yourself, you're wondering, is the other guy confessing or not? And of course, um, the police will use that to their advantage because they're gonna come in and say, well, we just got through talking to him. They're not gonna say to you, we got through talking to him and he confessed because that would be illegal if he hasn't. But they can come in and say, we just got through talking to him. Um, and so as a result, they can put pressure on you. Notice the pressure here in both cases is for you to confess because if you confess, then um, you think you may be better off. You could do the same thing with prices. Uh, the same, same thing would happen with prices where um, if you charge a high price and your competitor charges a low price, um, then you're not going to be as well off and uh, your overall profits will go down. What would be better is if both of you would charge a high price because both of you would be better off. Um, but the temptation is for you to lower your price in order to get the big payoff, the $1,000 per day payoff. And oh, by the way, this is known as a Nash equilibrium. And if you saw the movie Beautiful Mind, uh, Nash is the one who, this is what he was working on, uh, and he eventually received the Nobel Prize, Prize for working this out mathematically. Problem with these is that they're one-shot games. What do you do in the next time period after this happens? And the more times you repeat the games, the harder it gets and the more um, unlikely, the lower the probabilities get on any particular series of moves. And so as a result, um, I find them singularly unhelpful. So let's compare for a second. How does oligopoly compare with perfect competition? In oligopoly, if the firms collude or operate with excess capacity, they're gonna have higher prices and lower output, so they are going to be similar to monopolists. In fact, they operate very much like monopolists. Uh, if they have price wars, that will lower prices. Um, however, they will have higher profits in the long run. So here we have all of the various different market structures all at one time. And here you can see um, how they vary on the various different characteristics that we talked about to begin with. They vary on the basis of the number of firms, uh, how much control over price they have, uh, what are the products different or are they all the same, uh, do they have barriers to entry or not, and uh, even some examples, some of which we've talked about. And you can see that um, it, it would probably be better if we had them arrayed a slightly different way. You can see that uh, perfect competition, as an example, has lots of firms, no control over price, no product differences, no barriers to entry, and agricultural markets are great examples of those. And you can see that the two imperfect competition forms, that's the two on the right, the last two we've talked about, are the most frequently occurring, but they're also the hardest to characterize because you see numbers over there, or you see things over there such as many or few, some or limited, and so it gets harder and harder uh, the, the more unstable those variables are, it's harder and harder to actually uh, characterize and talk about and come to solid conclusions about exactly how they're going to behave. Um, unfortunately, that is the most frequently occurring two types of market structures, and so we can't just ignore them, although our solutions don't always get to be exactly what we'd like for them to be. But I thought that last little matrix might be of some help to you. Well, we've now covered all four types of industry structures that we might see. Um, to, one of them, perfect competition, is a fairly rare one, but it's a great little benchmark for us to compare all the others with. And as you can see, the others are less efficient and not as good for society but in varying different degrees, dependent upon the control that uh, is released by the, the buyer of the product. 
Well, that's all for this time, and we'll see you next time.